Muy buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Good afternoon, evening to everybody. Welcome to KBR Fundación Mafre. This is the last uh, lecture of the series we started in February, and we couldn't do it better than with this conversation chat between Nicholas Nixon and Laura Ferrer. And this is a part of the exhibitions that we've just inaugurated at KBR, the Sisters Brown of Nicholas Nixon and the retrospective on Gary Winograd, or Winograd. Uh, which will be on until September. We'll be back in October with a series focusing on how photography has reflected revolutions since the 19th cent century until the Arab Spring. Because as we've done since February and we continue to do, we'll have a meeting with photography on uh, Tuesday every week from KBR, except for holiday periods. Nicholas Nixon doesn't require to be introduced. He's one of the leading photographers of the latest decades. He explores singular worlds, has a marked social concern, and he uncovers uh, hidden aspects of reality that have to do with the artist's private life, but which can be shared and can find uh, an echo in our own lives of memories and reminiscences, slowness, long periods, the absence of dramatic elements define his work and can be seen for almost five decades. Nixon uses a simple technique, almost obsolete, but impeccable with the use of the large format uh, camera that brings things closer to show the world's uh, that he uh, uh, picked uh, the, in his picture, old older people, people who are sick, and different uh, aspects of our life. Uh, we all know about the Sisters Brown that began in the 70s as a series, and which for the first time in the world are going to be presented at this uh, exhibition together with his latest photography up to 2020. I'm not going to uh, go into further detail uh, regarding this series because we've got Nicholas and Laura here for that purpose. But for us, it is very, uh, it's a very special occasion because this series was the first purchase that the foundation did when it began its uh, photography collection in 2007. We were aware that this series had become one of the most of the deepest reflections on portraits and the passage of time. Laura Terre studied uh, fine arts in Barcelona, did a PhD thesis on the Afan group. She's uh, organized many exhibitions of Spanish photographers. She has a very interesting and wide ranging archive. And she has done different work at the Reina Sofia, Spanish photography of the 50s and the 60s, or photography in Catalonia. And we have had her, uh, she's collaborated with us before, and that's why she's with us today. She's just written a text for the new edition that we've just published on the Sisters Brown, which includes very interesting materials in this new edition. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for being here from your home. Thank you to Laura from Madrid. You're going to inaugurate a new exhibition on Thursday, we know, and I remind you all that at the bottom of the screen on the right, there is an icon that says interpretation, and you can select either Spanish or English. And uh, you can also use the uh, chat to leave your questions, which we will uh, ask uh, Nicholas. Enjoy the talk, and please don't miss the exhibition. It's really great, and Nixon doesn't like to talk about his photography as art, but I think that is where you're going to see it. Thank you very much, and let's go. Hello, well, good, uh, good afternoon. Hello, Nicholas. Hello, Carlos. Thank you for your lovely words. I'm glad to be here. Laura, by her smile, tells me that she is too. Yes, I'm delighted. And um, I am uh, a bit, I'm anxious to get to know you. I'm anxious to get to know you. After all this time following you, pictures, uh, I, uh, I really am anxious to, to meet the human being behind the pictures. 
well, who's going to illustrate us and tell us about his passions, his feelings, and that search that has uh, caused him to produce such a marvelous body of work. Well, I only want to say that at the time that both of us, I'm guessing Laura's not too far from my age, that both of us, the time of us were um, being able to vote uh, for the first time, photography in this country was beginning to be taken seriously as collectible art. And so I feel like I've been, I've ridden along on a tidal wave of um, good luck because when I started, there wasn't much of an opportunity, wasn't much of a chance of anything. The museums didn't collect photography. Um, uh, few collectors did, but they were in the East Coast and they were fickle. Um, the Museum of Modern Art, you know, did, and they were wonderful from the start, but um, there wasn't, there wasn't, there certainly wasn't much of an economic way to, to live unless you wanted to photograph cars or jewelry or, 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 or mem models. Coming from Detroit, everybody thought when I told them I was going to start photography that I'd be a car photographer. And they were insulted when I said, no, I don't want to photograph whores standing next to Cadillacs. Um, because, you know, the deal is you get this beautiful, seductive woman and you stand her by this beautiful, seductive car and somehow that sells cars. That's, that's the world that I came from. And that's the world that I haven't been back to. <laughs> No, truly. Um, well, yeah, we belong to the same generation, but I think that uh, we're slightly even more delayed in Spain in terms of uh, valuing photography. It's one of our great issues right now. I think now we, uh, we do have a series of institutions like, for instance, uh, MAFRE, the Fundación MAFRE, which has opened this new center in Barcelona, KBR, where your exhibition, your show, is the third show that has been set up in that room, that new exhibition uh, uh, installation or facility. And I would like to start with that, because when I uh, went into the exhibition and I saw the Sisters Brown show, and this show, and I'm saying this for the public who hasn't been there to see it yet, the Nicholas Nixon show is currently on in Barcelona. It opened last week, and it's devoted to the full series of the Sisters Brown. And uh, we can see now on the screen, I think, some of the photographs, 45 photographs, and uh, they, uh, they are 45 years. They cover 45 years in the lives of these people. When I entered the the uh, the gallery and I saw on the walls I saw the series I was admired to see that ability of time to turn turn everything round events in a very cinematographic way an installation a show that really mm, we can see how time changes people and how we uh, become part of that gyration of time. Uh, something that I'd like Nicholas to explain to us is, well, in the development of this series, now 45, 45 pictures now, how do you think this makes us perceive time? What feeling do you get now that you, you can look back over these 45 pictures? Good question. You said something in your wonderful essay about time as raw material, um, something like that, that I was moved by. Um, and I think, I think it, it lets me pump a little air in the intervals between the years. It's almost like I can expand the time between the years in my mind, not with anything specific, but just so it can, so they can breathe, so they don't become um, compressed. It's, it's, it, it adds a dimension. Like um, one of the reasons I use a big camera is it not only gives things much more sharpness, but it gives more sense of depth. So in the kind of depth I'm talking about is not the kind that photographers usually talk about, which is 
you know, the difference between the foreground and the background, but the depth of spatialness around the description of something. So if you look at BB's face in this picture, you'll see that the light is hitting her. I'll go back to the other one. Um, the, the other one, the light is hitting her pretty flat. Whereas the light, because of the way I'm holding the flash, the light is hitting Lori on the, on the right uh, with a little bit more angle. And that's, that gives her face a little more volume and baby's face is a little more flat. Well, photography can show that wonderfully. Photography can show the difference between Mimi's shoulder and Bibi's shoulder. And you can feel it in the picture. That's why I use the big camera. You can feel it centrally. You don't just see it like you would in a book reproduction. Um, and so space, um, spaciousness is, is really, really matters a lot. And, and it's, all, it's always mattered to me. Um, I first I think I first started paying attention to it when I was looking at Cartier Brisson and the intervals between his his pictures. He would he would you know it was almost like uh, almost like he had a drawing. See, I just drew this when I was just sitting here, just to say every Matisse used to say that every single interval matters. It all is part of the whole, like a cracked glass, and you can't just take you can't just take the man in the middle and have the picture be about him and nothing else and have it be any good. It has to be about the whole picture. So anyway, I've failed but struggled to do that most of the time. And uh, I think the volume of photographic description lends itself to amplifying our sense of time. That's, I guess, the best way I can answer it. Now that you mentioned the depth, the depth of and the resolution, the sharpness, it's like an expansion, that depth. It's like an expansion of augmented reality that everybody's talking about now, uh, that we're adding to images. This is an interior, inside information, something that takes us towards the inside of things. So this sharpness, this appreciation of depth is something that has to be savored over time too. Uh, you cannot see or, what, or look at a picture at the speed that new technologies offer us, Instagram, where everything happens instantly. This depth also, uh, this sharpness of detail requires contemplation, requires time. It's a way of transcending. It's a way of going beyond what we have in front of us. This forced you to go with the uh, plate camera, camera, the big, large format camera, which does not allow that. It's not so agile, that agility of Cartier-Bresson in that dance uh, that accompanies uh, smaller cameras. When you did reportage, for instance, with the, uh, in the porches of the city of Boston, how, how what did you do with the camera? How did you manage to carry the camera around? How did you set up the scenography? How did you achieve that sharpness and that depth? Um, well, if you can put one of those pictures up, I'll tell you the story exactly of how it happened. Um, the, the basic answer is I learned Vamos to be... Ver. <laughs> yes, it won't. I don't think it'll be easy. Let's see if we can get one of those pictures up. You can, um, you can carry on. We'll try to put one of the pictures up. I think it might be a bit of a job. I learned, well, I, I learned to be fast. Um, that was part of what was good. When I was photographing the buildings in Boston, uh, I was up high and I could you know, take as long as I wanted. Um, there was only the wind and my own idea of what the picture was to slow me down. And when I went down on the ground afterwards, because I was bored, uh, the events started getting complicated and, and, and the first pictures were just called figure and landscape, I'd say, where the, where the figures were relatively small. As soon as they started getting as large as here, then the figures determined everything. But in any case, I had to learn to be fast. I had, the camera was always on the tripod. It was either walking around with me or in the back seat of a car. And from the time that I saw something, took the camera out of the back seat of the car, asked the people if I could take their picture, took their picture and went back in the car. It could take as little as 30 seconds. If, uh, if there was conversation, that was extra. 
and oftentimes there was, but the picture part was kind of like hunting. It was kind of like pouncing. It was like I saw something that they were doing and I made them comfortable with me taking it away. It was fast. Getting fast, I was proud of getting fast. Um, you know, I can put a whole, I can do all the mechanical stuff with the camera, you know, like a, like a wizard. Um, it's one of the only, only, only physical things on earth I can do well. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm, I'm proud of that too. I had to, I had to be fast because the events would go away. Somebody's, somebody's doing a sweet thing with their child on the porch. Um, they're not going to keep doing that while I screw around with my stupid equipment. They're, it's going to, it's going to fade quickly. So I have to be there. I have to be there and say yes to it. I'm sorry, I'm terribly sorry. I can't find the picture. But as we move along, I'm sure that the picture will surface. Um, one of the things people that come to the show will be able to see this full series of the Sisters Brown, which we're seeing on the screen. And we see over time they, they, they change. Uh, and they'll find the last, the final picture taken in 2020, where uh, the four sisters, can we see the 2020 picture, please? 2020. The four sisters, and we see as the pictures go by, the sisters are separate, are separate. They're in different quadrants due to the circumstances last year, the pandemic, <clears throat> and they couldn't get together. Family couldn't get together physically. And why did you do this photo like this, Nicholas? Why didn't you wait? Why didn't you do it, take a break? Was this photo necessary in 2020? Was it necessary in this 45 year long series? What? What's the conclusion? What, what are we seeing here? Uh, good question. We're, we're seeing my marking the year. One of the rules of the series, the unstated rules, is that we have a picture every year. And so if there was a, I could think of big catastrophes that might, might uh, eliminate it, but there was no reason not to have have this picture. So I just figured I would have everybody on a Zoom meeting and then I would take a screenshot of that with the, with the computer and then I would take a real 8 by 10 negative of the screen uh, with my camera so I would have a negative. Um, so the, the form of the picture is the same as all of them. I just thought it was important to check in. I just think if there was a gap of a year there would be questions that aren't interesting. I think the, the continuity of, of them uh, and whatever they wanted to show, uh, the worry in a couple of their faces is, um, and the uncertainty of where they stand is interesting. So, so yeah, I just thought we should, it was the best, I knew we had to do it and this was the best I could come up with. And they like it, I'm glad to say. Well, yes, it's almost inevitable in these last days, last past few days, I've, I've been involved in different activities and it's almost an, uh, unavoidable to talk about the pandemic. Uh, how has the pandemic impacted a photographer like you who you had a long experience in f taking pictures of people in intimate situations, but you also like to meet people in other contexts. And you were experimenting with the uh, closeness of bodies. How has the pandemic, uh, what's the, what, what has it done to you? What are the wounds that this pandemic has left behind? And how are we going to recover the closeness and the intimacy of bodies, which have been so important and which have been so central to this whole pandemic thing? Well, that's another really good question. Um, 
during the pandemic, the usual way that I get people either by putting the word out or going and finding an expert and asking them to find me helpers, everybody was so nervous that uh, the best I could do was take pictures with a digital camera from six feet away with a telephoto lens. And they were kind of boring. They all kind of looked the same to me. Um, so I started photographing trees. I read a book called The Overstory, beautiful book about the way trees are alive as our ancestors. And um, there's a park nearby that has a series of 200 year old beech trees. And I went there every day for nine months and photographed there. And the pictures of trees are kind of human. They're kind of, kind of sensual. And I showed them to a psychiatrist and he said, these trees should have clothes on. Um, um, some are kind of erotic, I guess. And then I did a series of ginkgo trees in the Boston Arboretum. Um, and I love those pictures too. They're like J Japanese pattern screen pictures. And now I'm doing apple trees and I don't know where it's going. I'm a little, getting a little tired of trees. Um, I love the pictures, but I love that I can do it as freely as I could when I was photographing people before. I love it that I don't have to, you know, sign, sign HIPAA forms and go through a lot of red tape to, to get there. Um, I was hoping that by the time I kick off those, those rules and that those, those obstacles would be so, I mean, I, I wouldn't have to worry about them anymore because I'd be dead because um, they're getting worse every, every year. Um, so, but I'll figure a way to do it. I'll, you know, as soon as now that people are, now that people are looser, um, I have a, a couple of things occur to me as good to do. One is hard. I want to photograph, I'd like to photograph people while they're having their autopsy, but seeing their faces. Um, so you see the outside and the inside at the same time. And I only have a couple of doctors who are, who are even remotely interested and think it's possible. So that may just die for being an impossibility with germs and everything. But just think how great it would be. You know, a person where you can still see their face, but you can also see everything inside. Mm. Um, I'm still interested in flesh, but I'd like it to be very, 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 very old. Nobody, nobody, over, nobody under a hundred. Um, I volunteer um, at a housing project, a, a very poor one. And some of the residents I know would make very good pictures, but I would, I've done that before. What I'd like them to do is be naked and let me photograph just their skin, their old feathery, beautiful skin. And I, I'm not sure that'll fly either. I mean, I, can, I know some of them will do it, but the nurses might not feel comfortable letting me do it. So um, the other thing that's happened during the pandemic is that I feel less aggressive. I feel maybe it's just age, but I feel less, less comfortable about presuming that I can just go up to somebody and say, hey, can I take your picture, please? And if they say no, I, can, I would say, really? Come on, please. Um, that kind of force um, feels a little uncomfortable to me now whether that's the pandemic or my being older or the trees, I don't know. So I'm not in such a hurry to go radically um, impose my will and my force on human beings. We'll, we'll see what, how the, I'm, I'm nicer than I used to be. Well, I had a question ready and it was about one of the, La, uh, recent interviews you did in Spain in 2017. In that interview, you answered a question that had to do some, with something I wanted to ask you. In an interview that you had in, done in Spain in 2017, here in Spain when you came for your show, uh, you announced an idea which was to accompany people who of their own will wished or had made the decision to die. And now you're talking about the next level almost, autopsies. So what's, what's with this idea of, is that, that would be hugely controversial, a series of people 
who have decided to die. Uh, what, what do you think that would turn out to be like? A death, a voluntary death, and the passage towards that other state. And after that, of course, you would document the autopsies. But what about that project? Have you cast it off? Are you still thinking about it? I'm still longing for it, but I'm also resigned to the difficulty of it. Um, I think with social media now, I would get killed. I think Facebook would kill me the second day for being a predator and a manipulator and another bad white man who's doing something to people for his own benefit. And I just don't want to get involved in that. You know, I'll, I'll just take a picture of, of a flower instead. You know, I'm, I'm not going to I don't want to spend my life defending yeah. what I believe in because it doesn't fit the current standards of, of behavior. You know, I, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be doing anything wrong, but other people would be, would be saying I was. I mean, in my mind, I wouldn't be doing anything wrong. I would be trying to add, I, I'd be trying to make an addition to our understanding of, of the end of life, but um, to give it a dimension it hasn't got. The Death of Ivan Ilyich by Tolstoy is a wonderful, wonderful book wonderful story. Anyway, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit sad that it probably will not happen because of, so, because of social media has all come up in the last 10 years. You can't even photograph kids on the streets anymore without their mom, you know, taking a picture of you and sending it to the policeman. So um, the thing, you know, the pictures of kids that I started out loving of Cardi Brisson of them just playing in parks it was that way when I started too in the 60s. Um, it was pretty easy to photograph anybody anywhere, um, especially if they were especially if they were poor, because they're they're in the poorer neighborhoods. The mothers and fathers exercised a little less rigid control than they did in the upper suburbs, and so I was drawn to them because the kids were freer and were more themselves and le less less uh, regimented by their parents. Um, but even that's changed now with, with cameras and. So I'd, I'd feel funny about doing, making those same pictures now, um, not to mention that I'm different, but uh, I don't know. I think it would be, I think it would be hard. And I think it would be difficult for me to accept the rejection. Oh, you can't do that because we don't allow people to take pictures of people anymore. Cause what if we'll sue you? What if we'll, you know, we, we need a prenuptial agreement on this. You know, no, I, 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 I don't want to do that. I'd rather come over and take 20 pictures of Carlos. One a day for a year or all of you people i bet i bet i bet if i would propose that i come over and go to both madrid and barcelona and photograph all of the staff all of the people that you know who are willing to do it uh once a week or so with your children or without and gave everybody pictures and had the right to use as a group project the best ones for myself um I bet you I'd get a dozen interesting people to volunteer. Whether I could get Mopfrey to pay my plane or not, um, I don't know. But I, I just had the idea, you know, that that would be cool because they know about me. They're sympathetic to what I do. And so they'd likely be uh, emotionally willing to be available. I know Paula. I know Victoria. I know Nadia. I know they, they, they would be great to photograph because they like me. And I like them and we trust each other. Carlos Salvador. So maybe if Carlos is listening to this, we can we can put together a, a new project sometime. I, I love I love the idea. It'd be just Nixon in Spain. Nixon with Spanish friends. Okay, enough of my. You probably have a lot more you want to ask, Laura. I'm sorry to take up so much time. Well, no, what you've just said is fascinating because. It seems, it's unbelievable that in these times of maximum communication, our ideas, the immediacy of everything, hundreds, millions of people are reached in a second. And yet, and yet, we are more, censorship has come back again. We're applying censorship to everything. We are self-limiting. We're limiting what we do. We want to be correct. We want, and we want, uh, we don't want to, uh, you know, do anything to rock the boat. 
But self-censorship, I don't know what you think, but photography has a great advantage. The message of photography be becomes amplified through time. So perhaps what we should do is struggle against a dissemination in this current moment, but not stop taking photos, continue to take photos and maybe bury them, bury them and in the ground. And maybe in the future, somebody will find them like a treasure under the ground and they'll find, uh, they'll find out about today. Even if we left them in a box for 10 years and didn't show them, that would be, that could be good. I've thought of that. I've thought of that a lot. Not let the process get in the way, but do it and not let the people who are the subjects have any worry at all about being, you know, criticized on social media or anything at all. They'd just be between us and them. And I love that idea. I think it's really worth doing. I'm not sure how we get it funded. I mean, I could, I could pay part of it, but I, if my part, but I would need, uh, you know, having, having Mopfre or somebody to smooth it over and believe in it would be, would be very helpful. Um, and I think going to Spain or France, the other place that I know a little bit about the, the photography scene would be easier than doing it in this country. This country is full of, you know, really, really angry people who uh, have issues with almost everything. And uh, I almost think we should, we should get it in Europe before it goes in Europe too. Uh, hmm. Yes, maybe it's a problem. Globalization has absorbed everything. Uh, that police uh, kind of state uh, um, uh, um, mentality, uh, everybody's a police everybody's a policeman they're all trying to denounce their neighbors we've created a structure of control through these peepholes of social media yeah yeah it's true there's something that strikes me Nicholas you now you rep you've s repeated twice, you've spoken about financing, funding. I'm not saying it's not necessary, but your projects have always been very domestic, so to speak, very homemade. You've always had the possibility of doing things in a very humble, everyday way without having to resort to trips uh, very far away to big infrastructure. You have worked with very limited resources to achieve a, a, a top quality uh, body of work. The Sisters Brown, for instance. The Sisters Brown is, is just perseverance. Perse you have persevered, but uh, you use things that are very much at hand uh, in your own domestic life in your own family. Um, there's another thing that I'd like to ask you, which is a temptation we all have when we see this series. And I, th I think that you've escaped that temptation. And that's the anecdote of the story of each of these women, which is something you've opened the door of our imagination but how have you got away from the anecdote? I can imagine the amount of questions people have asked you about the lives of these women and the history and the stories of these women. You can't escape one of them because it's your own, she's your own wife. But uh, there's that aura of mystery that you've created. How did you do that? How did you create that aura of mystery? How did you get away from the anecdote? Well, early on, for the first few years, I thought the pictures were mine. I took them. I thought that they were mine. After mm, maybe five or 10 years, we talked about it. And in deciding which one to choose, it became clear to me that they were all of ours and that everybody should have a say 
in voting. And so it came up then that none of them wanted anything about their personal life revealed. So basically the answer is why I don't do that is because they would, they would castrate me. If, if, I spilled, if I told anything about their lives, that would be the end. You know, they would, they, would just, they would just say, that's it, Nick, we're not taking any more pictures and you just step over here, we've got a present for you. Um, no, I've, I've promised that they want, they, that's the way they want it. And um, I, I agree. I would spill more beans if it, if it were just up to me, but um, there, there are two of them, especially that are just hard as nails about keeping private. One of them, if you, if you, if somebody notices her on the street, you know, gets huffy. Um, one of them loves it. BB sort of gently amused and passes by, and I don't know what the fourth one does. Um, but there, what was the first part of your question, Laura? I had, a, I had something good about the, the the, uh, the first part of that last question. No, eso que, que siempre, eh, well, no, yes. We're always wondering about the personal lives of these women. It's a huge temptation. When you look at these pictures, you wonder about the lives. And I was just wondering how you'd got away from it. And you've just told us. Yeah. You've just told us because you've, you've made it quite clear that you were forced. Um, but on the other hand... <laughs> Uh, I thought you wanted to say something, did you? Yeah, yeah. One, one thing. Um, in, the, in the era of uh, digital photography, and I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's bad. Not, not, not at all. Um, I have a digital camera. Um, but in the area where it is the norm, the authority of a photograph as a witness has declined. Um, what you can do to change things, whether you want to or not, is almost infinite. You can make any kind of thing that looks like a photograph, but it's not. Whether, it, whether it's a, a simple little lie or whether it's a big, you know, changing a background. Um, I think photography since the beginning of it has been a witness to what is. And I'm glad that it still is. And that's the spirit in which I want to keep carrying it on. I, I don't think, I don't think manipulation can do can make up for it. And I don't think you can say that analog photography is is. Um, I mean, the digital photography is the same. Of course, with a high intention, a, a digital photographer can make a picture that's a hundred percent honest and true. But we don't know. Somebody else later on could fool around with it. And the other argument people make is that you can fool around with analog photographs, but it's really ham-handed. The kinds of things you can do to change analog photographs are really crude and pretty much pretty much show. The way you can change them, I can put a, if I have a picture of a gun at somebody's head like this, I can say, okay, put a gun to somebody's head and then they do it and then it's a picture and it's true, but it's a picture of somebody acting under my orders, putting a gun. It's not my imagining it, it's something that actually happened. Um, however foolish. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's power has always fascinated me. I mean, you know, that's it. That's the world. And it never ceases to be interesting. Well, actually, um, that's another thing. Uh, what you've just said, um, there are photographers who are very worried about sending you a message. They want to give you this message, the ideological message through their pictures. But you, one of the quotes that I loved from an interview or something you wrote, I think it was something you wrote at the beginning of your career when you exhibited at, uh, with the new documentalists, um, and you said the most, the world you said was interesting enough and that you had enough with the world. You did not feel the need to add anything to it. All you had to do was to rescue and to, and to congeal the interest of the world as it was. Is that reality enough? Is it really enough to express what you have inside you, to communicate that message? What is the discourse of photography for you? What is it? It's a really good question. 
if you take a picture of a water pump that most people would take, a white water pump next to a barn, most of the pictures would be probably pretty pedestrian. All of them would be true. The Walker Evans picture of the barn of that, of that subject is no less true, but because of his intelligence and where he stood and because of his eye, he was able to make it become not just a water pump, but a prototype of all water pumps. And I don't think in doing that, he takes away from the individual water pump. I think he's just seen it so brilliantly that it becomes bigger. I think I, when, I'm, when I take a picture of the four sisters, in the back of my mind, I just wanna take a picture of four good women. I don't care if they're sisters. I don't care if they like me. I don't care anything. I just wanna take the best picture I can of these four women who are present in front of me. Um, so the paradox, when I say it's a witness, most, most witness pictures, that's why when you say documentary, most people think boring because if, if your first point is to either illustrate something or to just document something, the pictures are liable to be artistically boring. It's true. But if what you want is to make something more interesting, something a little more whole, a little more that has a little bit more magic in it, you, 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 can, get, you can get something better if you're lucky. And lots of people in the history of photography have showed us ways to do it. Um, You know, the, the shadow, the, shad, the, the parallel shadows in this picture, um, the truthfulness of that mixed in with the sensuality of their legs, mixed in with the hardness of a couple of their faces, those, those things all happened at that one moment. I think that's really interesting, all that, all that happening together. Um, and we don't really question it, but, but we, we don't really notice all those things at the time, but you know, sometimes it's my job to, to notice them if, if I think they're, they're good drama and true. Does any of this make any sense? I feel like I'm kind of babbling. No, no, no. Tiene, tiene mucho no, 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 it does. It makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. And there's something that I think what you've said, what you said about the prototype, the water pump, uh, how that becomes a prototype, that picture. Um, uh, when it comes to references, well, in this case, women, these four women, specific women, become a kind of reference for women as a whole. And they become a kind of milestone in a chronology. I like to follow the calendar the history through the faces of these women. I like to feel that, for instance, in that initial year, 1975, in Spain, Franco was on his deathbed. So it's a completely different reality. But we Richard can see... Nixon, Richard Nixon had just resigned. I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, no, no. No, no. No, the idea was to understand how history comes to you through these faces, which are, uh, how would I say, they're intemporal, these, these faces, in a way. There's a contradiction, big contradiction, uh, in terms of documentary photography. But documentary photography always wants to congeal the fact in history. The fact in this case is a biography. It is even more than that. It is, it, it is the biology of the bodies of these women. You were talking about taking pictures of people that are 100 years old, 15 years old. We're feeling history in an intemporal way, but at the same time, in the, in the, in the, in the, strongest possible way which is the, the the body have you ever been has anybody ever said to you that your photography was lacking in political commitment for instance social commitment in terms of the evolution of time and history and the events of history 
I don't know whether I've made, I'm explaining what I mean, but has well, that happened to you? Yeah, I, well, I asked myself that question. I think that's why, that's why um, I started the People with AIDS Project. I think I was, I was concerned that the only people with AIDS in, the, in this country that were getting any press and attention were upper middle class gay white men. And um, the coverage only started when they were very ill. And so the, the white straight public pretty much had an idea and black had an idea of, it, of it, these guys as scary guys as, and it's not them, it's other. So that seemed kind of narrow to me in, in, my, in my small way. I figured if I, if I could try to make a book of people where you just were showing the individual, which is what I like to do, then maybe maybe the stiff elbow might soften a little bit. Maybe, maybe if people could see that they're just people and you know have crumbs on their chest, just like anybody else, it might make a difference. And so it, I don't know if it made any difference or not, but that was my impulse then. My other impulse is if you look at my school pictures and you look at my people outdoors, I'm very conscious in a subliminal way of making races equal. I don't want I don't, I don't want anybody to tell me I have to do it, but I think that, um, Black Americans have gotten a really raw deal, and I can't really change that in any quick way like everybody would like us to, but I can certainly show the humanity of the people who come in front of me and show that as being the same as anybody. Um, and so in, I've tried to do that for 30 years. Um, I'm surprised somebody hadn't st started to do a Black Four Sisters. You know, if they started now, it would still be interesting. I mean, I'm sure I'm gonna get a lot of press the next big book that comes out uh, uh, that, that, that this is too narrow, that it's just too white. Um, and it's right, it is too white. That's what I came from. I mean, that's what I am. Um, I learned my craft in a white school. Yes, in fact, <clears throat> one of the things that surprises in your work of the porches of houses is that how close you get to the black community. I'm nice. How did they feel when this white man came along with this huge camera? How did they feel? I, I presume you had to uh, explain quite a lot how it worked and what was it like? Because, I mean, you, you really got up close. I mean, you really went into their world, into their community. And there's, you can see communication. It's quite, quite unusual. Well, in this country, it used, at least, there's an unspoken contract that if you're on your front porch, it can be any degree of private or public, depending on the wishes of the inhabitants, of the owners. So the porches or the situations I would stop at where I thought something was looking good were ones where I, I, I felt the people were open and might be responsive to a little playing around or a picture. Um, so I had something going for me in the, in the first place. The other thing is they were usually often doing something that I liked the look of, you know, like, oh, look at the way you're holding that necklace or, oh, man, put the way your, your hand is on her shoulder. Can I take a picture of that? So I start in with something specific that I think is good. And I ask about that. And um, I'm also charming. You know, I, I can, I can, I don't lie, but I can make people feel easy. And, 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 and uh, I'm also very determined. I also, um, you know, want the picture pretty badly. Uh, once I came back to the car, Bibi was with me. And I came back to the car after some people had said no. And I was angry. Um, she said, you, you have no right to be angry. You know, for you, what, are you, what are you being angry for? I said, because it was so beautiful and I can't have it. And she said, well, it's not yours to have. You have to make your peace with just being grateful for what you do get. So I, I learned something from that. Um, but I'm hungry. I'm hungry when I'm out there. Um, and I think I don't want to walk away because the camera gives enough time to talk and to make peace. We often exchange names um, and try to bridge the gap. And, you know, I, I send them pictures afterwards. Um, they give me their address and I send them to them. 
if they want them. Some people say, nah. Um, uh, but so I think it's, it's, a, it's a very limited communication, but I think it's an effective one. I get a truthful picture, they get a picture that, that a funny guy with a big camera took of them. Um, the door is open for more communication if they want. I've been back to some of their houses a couple of times. Um, and I, you know, I live, I go, I think I'd have a hard time in places where the neighborhoods I, I photograph in Boston are sort of mixed. So being black, at least in Boston, in, in, in many of the neighborhoods is not a big deal. There are some that are all black too. And I, I, feel, I feel more like a stranger in those. I, I, I volunteer at a all black housing project and I, I feel, always feel like a rich white guy there. Um, and they just have to kind of accept me as that. I haven't tried to take pictures there yet, but um, maybe sometime. Uh, I don't know, I, I, I just feel like I have this, this almost mission to make, a, to make a connection because I want it so bad. I have this mission, I feel like I, like I ought to, like I ought to try my very best to make the commission, make the connection uh, vital and honorable. I don't know if that makes sense or it's just bullshit, but I don't know how to answer it exactly. <clears throat> yes, yes, you have, certainly. Um, there's something that strikes me in your work. The short distance, the close-ups of intimate photography and that other more documentary photography, which normally documentalism in the American documentalism the photographers or the cinematographers, the filmmakers, or even the writers that have described uh, America and the people of America, um, it's like they are cruel in a way or incisive, not cruel, incisive. They, they, they seem to go into the wound of things in a society that is often very violent like Faulkner, William Faulkner. I read William Faulkner as a result of your, of your interest. You mentioned Faulkner in your writings. He was a novelist that I was not familiar with and I read him and I was fascinated. But the world that Faulkner opened up to me was practically opposite to yours. It was the opposite to your way of looking at things. Your way of looking at things is very sweet, very pleasant. I don't know what you think, not so harsh. Do you feel that you're part of that realism, that current of realism, of harsh realism, or do you think your music is slightly different? What a great question. I think my music started out being harsh, like Walker Evans and like Falcon. I think as, like, as a young man, I think in the back of my mind, I was trying to show I was trying to point a finger at what was ironic or silly or commercial or, uh, or like, like Arbus, Arbus showed fake. Um, excuse me, I have to sneeze. <coughs> but over the, I think photographing the people, I just changed. I got more sympathy. I got sympathy for the individuals. And so I didn't feel like I could, like they were types anymore. I didn't feel like I had any right to, you know, if somebody's fat to make fun of him or if somebody's um, eating a greasy hot dog and it's falling all over his shirt, make fun of him or take a picture of him if he's mean to his child. Well, I might take a picture of him if he's mean to his child because that's part of life, but I wouldn't, I, I, I just feel kinder. I feel more kindly disposed toward people. You know, Arbus, um, there, you can find pictures of Arbus that are kind of rough and not particularly nice. But one of my favorites that I have a print of, I'm going to show you right now. Can you see it without reflections? It's the sword swell. Sí, se ve bastante bien. Sí. Yeah, I, I just love it. It's um, maybe it's one of one of the pictures that sort of got me away from irony because 
I don't, I don't think she's making fun of this woman at all. I think she's celebrating her in her difference for being in her almost <clears throat> Christ-like way, supporting the art of magic. Um, and it's kind, and it's kind, and it's positive. And so maybe I've even gotten more that way. Maybe that's why I feel uneasy about going out and being a, um, a warrior again. But I'm still developing, and I'm getting nicer is the answer. Maybe I'll just take pictures of bed sheets, bed sheets and quilts, cotton, silk, soft things, hair. It's a good project. That's a good project. Very good. Uh, one of the last, we've got three minutes left before we let the audience in. Uh, for the well, questions. Well, Laura, if you think that's a good idea, write me about it. If you think it's, if you think it's a good idea, tell me what you think. I, I need some inspiration for that. Sí, pues mira, yo lo okay, I prefer it because I'm a better, I'm better at writing than talking. I'm not having a good time here, Nicholas, I can tell you. I'm not a good interviewer. I have no future as an interviewer. Yes, but I read your wonderful essay, and I know how smart and insightful you are, and so I'm delighted with wh however you are in person. Bueno. <laughs> pues, pues así lo haré. Así well, lo haré. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Good. Um, just a, a last question, and that is, is a question that I've been asked many times, and I've been not very good at answering it, because I'm a teacher like you but uh, but younger people perhaps I teach younger more tender people and they're almost starting out in life and they are looking looking for for something what is the answer when people ask you what can I do how do I go about being in the world what should I observe what is worthwhile for me to photograph? How would you answer that question? Well, the first thing would be to let your deepest instincts be the thing that you start out trusting the most. If they are not acceptable to you, then question why not? Because they are your instincts. If you're a killer, I'm not talking about that extreme, but if you have some violence, if you have some regret, if you have some hatred, if you have some longing, if you have some adulterous thoughts, if you have some ambition to be rich, if you have some fondness for animals, whatever, whatever anything that you have in your life that you have a strong instinct for, start there. Um, I think the reason I started photographing Boston was it, was, it was a little bit intellectual too. I'd seen Walker Evans, but I also had just moved to Boston. And I'm a guy from Detroit and Detroit is no city, I'll tell you. You know, when you move to Boston, it's wonderful because there's history. They, they, they keep the buildings, you know, without tearing them down. They're six stories tall, they're very civilized. People are polite on the streets to one another. There's no trash. So I was like, boy, this is, this is great. I wanna live here. Um, this was even before I moved here. Take the thing that moves you the most and go with it. And I think if it's at all possible, try not to let money or what your parents think get in the way. Not let any, or, or your, don't let anything get in the way from at least the basic instinct. If you want to take a picture of somebody naked, ask them to do it. If you want us to take a picture of somebody sitting on their husband's lap, ask them to do it. If they don't want to do it, let them say no. My kind of main rule is if there's a question, say yes. If you have a question about anything, say yes. If I'm looking at three pictures and I'm leaning toward one more, that's the one to say yes to because something's talking to you that you, you, don't, you don't know about. You want to open the channel to that. It's not, it's not, 
uh, straight photography is in kind of a hard time now as far as making, you know, making a living. Um, I think I lived out its first glory period. Uh, and the art world seems to be not so, not so uh, keen on sincerity anymore. And um, I am. Do you think that sincerity, sincerity today, people, do you really think people don't like sincerity today? Do you think we can say that? I think people mistrust the false use of it. And it's become a little bit polluted because there's enough fake sincerity around that it's gotten a little bit untrustworthy and therefore it's easy to make fun of it and do something that's critical because that's clearer. Um, I, I, I choose to just stay sincere and if people, people can take it or leave it. Um, I'm lucky because I have a kind of reputation of being a guy who does that. So, you know, I, my, I, have, a, I have a history, but um, I think it's wonderful. If you look at the film, if you look at the films of Ozu, Oh my gosh, how good they are. The films of Renoir. Oh my gosh, they're totally, totally without guys and without, without irony, without second thoughts. Um, sometimes I think the very highest art does. Uh, but then exceptions always come along and prove me wrong. So I wouldn't say that to be absolutely. Sincerity works, I think. Muy bien. Well, very good. Very good. I think we can let the audience in. Questions from the audience, Nicholas, if you agree. Sure. Questions from, from the audience. Is Carlos going to do this? You're going to take care of this? Yes, yes, I will. Uh, hello, good evening. Um, there are some questions. And many congratulations. People have said congratulations. They have enjoyed this conversation between Laura and Nicholas very, very much. It's been fascinating, I have to say. Congratulations to both of you because you've gone beyond photography. You've gone into the core of humanity, which is the most interesting thing. Um, there was a question about the photograph of 2020, the last autumn photograph in the series. And this person in the audience says, do you think that photo is like a blot on the project? That 2020 photo, you've had to do screenshots instead of taking a photo of the four women in front of you physically in order not to leave that year empty. You've done screenshots. Uh, do you think, if you look at the, the, the project, would that be a blot on the project? Or maybe a milestone, because COVID has been a milestone in everybody's life. What does it mean? What does the 2020 picture mean to you in the context of the whole project? I think it's a comma. It's a pause, it's a comma, it's different, but it's going on. What do you think, Laura? Well, I th it made me think a lot, that picture, because really, um, it is a pause, it is. It's like when on the cassette tapes in the old days, there was a noise all of a sudden, and then the tape went back to normal, and the sound was normal. There was a s distortion, and then it went back to normal. Well, this was something like that. I, I felt unpleasant. It was, first of all, unpleasant, because there was always that proximity of bodies. And in that 2020 picture, what we see, the bodies are no longer there. They're far away. They're locked in, in those quadrants. And uh, it seems a symptom, a clear, a, clear, a clear reflection of the pandemic. I mean, that's clear. The other day, the prize, the Pulitzer Prize was given to a compatriot of ours, 
Emilio Morinati was given the Pulitzer Prize for a series of photographs on the effects of the pandemic on older people, mm. on el the elderly, who were in homes and they were locked up in care homes, nursing homes. There's a picture where you see that there's a couple, a couple, a married couple, and they're separated by a piece of plastic. And the piece of plastic has got holes in it, holes in it with sleeves. So these people can touch each other and they're embracing the, each other through plastic, which is completely ridiculous. There's no contact between the bodies. It's an absolutely terrible thing. And it's a symptom of what we've become. They are allow, they're allowing them to embrace, but it has to be through plastic. They can't touch each other. It's, that picture of uh, 2020, you were saying before, earlier, you were saying that it, they became, your pictures of the four women became a prototype. Those women became a prototype for, for women. But in 2020, in the picture, in the 2020 picture, it's really, uh, it's really a clear image of 2020 and what 2020 was about and what it was, they're, they're completely segregated. It's a, it's a, it's a picture of segregation. Uh, they're, they're split apart by the, the communication is broken. Uh, and it was a screenshot you had to take. You had to take screenshots. Nothing else was allowed. There's a, there's a segregation in space. I don't think that it's a blot. I wouldn't call it a blot on the project. On, on the, uh, quite, quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. It is, it, is, it is showing these atrocious conditions of separation and segregation that people have been through. And I believe, if you allow me, when we see the show, and it's the last picture in the series, and it, it really does strike you. It does strike you because you see the sisters through time, the fraternal relationship, the sisters, and all of a sudden, bang. But I presume in a few years' time, let's hope many years' time, that picture will be like an anecdote, like a like a, an anecdote in the past. It won't be so important as it seems now. Yes, yes, I believe. I, but, 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 but I, provided the next picture goes back to the old normal. But this is the first question I asked Nicholas, really. What wounds has this pandemic left behind? How are we going to get out of this? How, how this trauma that we've been through, all of us, which has forced us, us in the Mediterranean countries, I mean, we love to touch each other, to get close to each other, but we've changed. Our way of, our whole way of being has changed. The way we relate to people, I think, Maybe it's, it won't be an anecdote, you know. I think maybe it won't. I think maybe it will last longer than we think. And I think that the consequences, we, we'll, have, we'll see what the consequences are. I think if, if uh, as the series goes on, and I hope it will, um, the way they look in the next few years' pictures will be probably a little bit more charged than it would have been had there been no pandemic. Because they'll have gone through it. They'll have, they'll have, they'll have made this picture and then the being back to normal, it will be different for each one of them, but they're all, they're all still loving and together. And so I think the combination of those two things might make a pretty interesting uh, result. I hope so. There's another question. Carlos de Paz asks, uh, yeah about the difficulty today of taking pictures in the street, taking pictures of people. And he tells an example, a photographer was beaten up recently by an individual whom he was photographing. And the controversy was not so much the beating he took 
He ended up in hospital, but the controversy focused on whether the photographer should have tried to take that picture or not, whether he was doing the right thing or not. So that's the question. The qu well, if you're out on the street with a camera there, you know, you, you, you got to pay attention to everything. You're going to photograph somebody who, you, who offends somebody. You're going to photograph somebody's girlfriend in a way that they see as, as, uh, as aggressive. You're going to get too close to them when you sense that they're not. Um, they might slug you. I mean, that's always been the case. Gary Winogrand got in fights because he, he pushed the line of getting too close. Um, I might expect it's never happened to me. Well, yes, it did. A woman, a woman pushed my pushed my shoulder and told me to go away when I was trying to photograph a baby. Um, and I just, and it was because of the times. I said, "Oh, could I take the picture?" You know, they're walking down the street. She was holding the baby. Her her friend stopped, was walking by, and I said, "I did my oh, because the baby's the arm was reaching out and the sun was on and it looked like God." And so I said, "Please, could I take that?" And the the friend said, no, no, go away from here. And I said, usually when that happens, I say, oh, please look at how beautiful it is, please. And I talk him into it. And she said, no, fuck off. And she, you know, just rushed and she hit me. Um, so that never would have happened before that she thought she had the right to abuse me because I was only trying to be persuasive. Um, and it was out of love, it was out of affection. I, I, don't, I don't think she thought I was meaning any harm, just that I was bothering her. Anyway, I'm not surprised, Carlos. There's a zillion different situations. And if somebody's an asshole, they're going to get nailed. Mm -hmm. a ver, hay otra pregunta, como muy general, de Nacho, que, There's eh, another question, a general question, that says, how have you looked at the aesthetics of this series? It's a very wide question. A series, the Sisters Brown, that's been going on for 45 years, but that's question. The aesthetics, the es well, Carlos, to help focus this question, there is something that uh, Nicholas mentioned earlier when he spoke about the depth of the uh, picture. He mentioned the use of flash for pictures because most of them are done, uh, are exteriors taken outside. They're also taken at times when the light is very low, most of them. Yes, what is the, I'm curious to know, the aesthetic approach to light, because there is an intention there, is there not, Nicholas? Oh yeah, but it's very practical. <clears throat> If I'm in a, if you look some in some of the pictures where it's just all white, that's because we're we got together at a wedding, and the only time I could take the picture was in a room next to the wedding, and they were all dressed up. So I used a flash. the The camera I use is slow. I can't take a quick picture indoors. If I were to take a picture of Carlos sitting there right now in his hotel room, the exposure would be about 10 seconds. He's not going to hold still that long. Now, so I have a choice. I can either take a flash picture of him or I can take a flash picture and let some of the light and some of the reflections show in the picture as well. That's usually my way. I prefer to have as much of the existing light as possible, but I need to, st I need to stop the action with the flash. So some of those flash, most of the flash pictures are by necessity. If I used a small digital camera, they'd never, never need to happen at all. That's why people like digital cameras. You can take a picture anywhere. Um, I'm, I'm envious of that. Sí, pero la, la, la luz en realidad, yes, but the light, the light in your pictures, in your photos, and that can be seen clearly from the beginning with the porches, is another element of the photograph. The, uh, the sunset, the light of the sunset, and the depth of those beams, those rays of light, they're an element of the composition. Absolutely. They're part of the beauty of what's there. Well, we don't have any more questions. I don't know whether you have anything to add. We've made note you want to come to Spain. We're delighted. We hope to see you here soon. Carlos, what did you, th what did you think of my project idea? Bueno, muy interesante. Good. Oh, it's very interesting. We could start with Paula. Sí. 
he's dying for me to take her picture. Sí, absolutely. Bueno, eh, podemos hablar más tarde. We can talk about it later. We can yeah, talk like about it. it. I just got the idea, you know, it's it's a uh, Sabes que, que aquí se te quiere mucho en España y que... We love you in Spain, as you know, and we're very proud to have this incredible collection of your photographs that we see a part of now at the KBR in Barcelona. We're delighted. Well, you were the first to see the value of the whole series and, and to put your money down, so I'm entirely grateful to you for very many shows and for a wonderful friendship. And to you, Laura, for your... Uh, support and for your wonderful essay to this book. I, I think it's awfully good. Awfully good. A little bit over some people's head, I'm sure. I had to figure out what bifurcation meant. Um, but uh, I think it's a very good essay. <laughs> I absolutely agree. <laughs> sí, bueno. a mí... Yes, I, I, will, I will tell you, Nicholas, uh, I tried to express very humbly that there was a huge amount of possibilities to interpret all this work. It looks simple, this work, but it's very complicated. There was something very strong in, 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 at the bottom, at the back of all this, and I had to unravel all that complication. And sometimes when you're writing, you feel like leaving, uh, uh, stopping, and uh, just go to the pictures again. Uh, people want, I invite people to think for themselves when they stand in front of a picture and confront, and confront the image. And to, people should be able to put themselves in the head of the photographer and look at that for the first time. And that's what I tried to do. But I... Very humbly, I, I put myself in the head of many people in order to understand things that are much more complex than they seem. And that's why it looks so intellectual, so high level, so highbrow. I hope it, 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 it looks natural. I, I hope it, it, it's sincere too. And it is perceived as sincere what I wrote. An exercise to unravel the complexity of this series. But I get the feeling that this is a human depth, uh, a, a life experience depth, more than an intellectual depth. And that's what I would like to, to communicate. But everything gets complicated. As you know, everything gets complicated. And sometimes instead of making things clearer, you mix them up more. But uh, some people take pictures and other people write about those pictures about the pictures. So I think there's room for all of us and we complement each other. Me too, absolutely. Bueno, pues, muchísimas yeah, gracias. Good. Thank you very much to both of you. Oh, New you questions really. are coming in, but we're going to leave it. We're going to have to leave it here. Thank you very much. This has been a very intense year we've had, unfortunately with COVID which has forced us to go online for these lectures, but we've done them. On the 5th of October, we'll have the next one, which by chance is a cycle that Laura is organizing on photography and revolutions, a very interesting cycle, 11 lectures. And we will start with another big name of photography, Paolo Gasparini, an exhibition in September, and we'll have a meeting with Paolo, who has lived through many South American revolutions. Thank you very much to everybody. Have a good summer, and we'll see you soon, and go to the KBR to see the show. Thank you. Thank you.